There's a new kid on the block when it comes to multiple sclerosis treatments, which is the subcutaneous drug Ofatuumab, a repurposed leukemia drug. And in two randomized clinical trials, it completely destroyed the pill Abagio. Today, we're going to review the results of the Asclepios 1 and 2 trials, looking at relapse rates, MRI data, serum neurofilament, brain volume loss, and side effects of the drug. Let's have some fun. This video is based on two clinical trials called the Asclepios 1 and 2 trials, and I'll go ahead and post a link below. They were both published simultaneously recently, even though the trial was completed a while ago. And I should say I have no specific financial conflict of interest. My name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. So the drug ofatumumab actually is already FDA approved for chronic leukemia in an intravenous formulation called Arzera. It's very similar to the drug Ocrevus, and I have a separate video on Ocrevus if you want to take a look. And it's also similar to the drug Rituximab, and I have a video on that drug if you want to take a look. But the side effects are very, very similar between all three of these drugs. This could be considered to be a, a Me Too drug. It works by binding a receptor on B cells called CD20, and it breaks open or lyses and destroys these cells, essentially all of them, and depletes them to very low levels. Historically, it was thought that MS was a T-cell mediated disease, but we now know that B lymphocytes are very important in generating inflammation in multiple sclerosis. And Arzera is actually available, and I actually do prescribe it to some people with multiple sclerosis, and I've had fairly good results with it. Now, as you can see, this is data from Asclepios 1, seeing that the B cells go down very, very quickly. The red is the control, which is teraflunamide or abagio, and the blue is the B cell levels in individuals who received ofatumumab. And I should say the actual trade name of this drug is not yet known. So it works very, very quickly. And with intravenous B cell depleters like rituximab and ocrelizumab, ocrevus, it happens within hours. I'm not sure if it's quite that quick with ofatumumab, but it's very, very quick. Now, the, we can take a look at different types of antibodies, and the idea is that ofatumumab is supposedly fully humanized. So all aspects of the protein are made of human proteins, and it's thought to sort of decrease the risk of infusion reactions. So ocrevus is sort of partially humanized. Rituximab is chimeric. In other words, there's some amount of mouse protein and some amount of human protein. The problem is that all of these drugs can potentially cause reactions, and the reason because a lot of the reactions are actually due to depletion of B cells rather than due to antibodies against the drug. Though certainly some people receiving these drugs can develop antibodies against them and it could potentially make them less effective. Now let's look at the two trials, ofatumumab versus abagio. These are two identical trials. They're randomized, double-blind, double-dummy trials. So randomized means you're randomly assigned to whether you get ofatumumab or whether you get abagio. It's double-blind. Neither the patient nor the examiner knows what person got the drug. And also it's double-dummy. In other words, if you are randomly assigned to ofatumumab, you have to take a fake pill, a fake abagio pill. And if you are randomly assigned to uh, to Abagio, you would take a fake injection. And so you don't know what you're getting, of course, unless you have unblinding side effects. So there were a total of 946 who got ofatumumab, and it was given 20 milligrams subcutaneously weekly for three weeks, and then every four weeks. So the initial injections are done in the clinic with supervision, just in case there's a reaction, because these drugs are known to cause injection reactions. And after that, you would do it at home. And then the pill you just take daily at home, and 936 received Abagio, 14 milligrams daily, which is the higher dose of Abagio. And you had to be between age 18 and 55 to be in this clinical trial. The average age was 38, mostly females, 67% females, which kind of reflects the overall proportion of people with MS who are women. And the average baseline EDSS was 2.9. So EDSS is Expanded Disability Status Score, which is a measure of disability in multiple sclerosis. So it's from 0 to 10. I have a separate video on this topic if you want to take a look. But basically, 0 means no disability. 
three would be sort of mild to moderate disability, and six would mean that a cane is required to walk 100 meters. So to get in this trial, you had to have an EDSS between 0 and 5.5, and the reason people they excluded people with an EDSS 6 or above is because it's very difficult to demonstrate a difference when someone is using a cane. They tend to get stuck at 6 for a long time. Also, they wanted people to have signs of inflammatory activity, so you had to have at least one relapse in the last year, or two relapses in the last two years, or one active or gadolinium enhancing lesion on MRI, and almost everyone in the trial, about 94% in these two trials, had relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, and this trial was 30 months, though the median follow-up was only 1.6 years. Now, let's look at the primary outcome, which is the rate of relapses. So in the Asclepios 1 trials, those who got off a tumumab had an annualized relapse rate of 0.11. In other words, every nine years, they had on average one relapse, so a very low rate of relapses. Whereas people taking Abagio had an annualized relapse rate of 0.22. So there was a 50% additional benefit to taking Ofatumumab. So Ofatumumab was much better. In the Asclepios 2 trial, it was even a greater difference. So those receiving Ofatumumab had an annualized relapse rate of 0.1 versus 0.25, or 1 every 4 years, who were receiving Abagio. So those receiving Ofatumumab experienced a 60% reduction. So it was much, much better. Now, if you look at disability, this is three-month disability progression. And the idea is sometimes people have relapses, but they get better immediately afterwards, so it's not that clinically meaningful. But this looks at worsening disability that is sustained three months later. And at the end of the trial, 15% of people taking Abagio had disability progression versus 10.9% in people who were taking Ofatumumab. And this was highly statistically significant, p-value of 0 0.002. And if we look at six-month disability, disability progression, it's more or less the same. 12% experiencing six-month disability progression, which means you get worse, and you're still worse six months later, versus 8% who are receiving ofatumumab. So it's about a one-third reduction in disability progression. Now, if you think about it in absolute difference, it's not that big of a difference. So you could think of this, if you take ofatumumab versus Abagio for a 30-month period, and of course the average follow-up was only 1.6 years, you have an absolute chance of 4% of, of not having disability progression when you otherwise would have taking Abagio. Again, this is not versus placebo, this is versus an active comparator. Uh, now, this is looking at improvement. So 11% of people taking Ofatumumab experienced confirmed disability improvement after six months versus only 8% teraflunamide. So you had a greater chance of improving as well. Now let's look at the MRI outcomes. So this is Asclepios 1, and if you look at active lesions, very, very few people had active lesions taking ofatumumab. The mean number of new active lesions was only 0 0.01, so very rare, versus 0.45 on Abagio. So a 45x difference, tremendous difference. For new or enlarging T2 lesions, for people taking ofatumumab, the mean new or enlarging T2 lesions was 0.72 versus 4 for Abagio, so over a fourfold difference. And when you look at Asclepios 2, it's very similar data. The average number of enhancing lesions was 0.03, very low with ofatumumab, versus 0.5 for Abagio. For average number of newer enlarging T2 lesions, it was 0.64 for ofatumumab versus 4.15 with Abagio. Now let's look at side effects. So this is the Asclepios 1 trial, and you'll see it's kind of similar to the Asclepios 2 trial. A lot had adverse events, but many of them were very trivial. The rate of discontinuation was slightly higher in people taking ofatumumab versus teraflunamide or Abagio, 5.8% versus 5.2%. Overall, infections were about the same, 49.2% versus 51.5%. And interestingly, injection-related reactions were about the same. So 16.1% for ofatumumab versus 16.5% with Abagio. I'm not sure what's happening here because these people are just receiving a saline injection. So I'm not sure if they're having some antecebo effect or something like that. But it seems that ofatumumab is not associated with a very high rate of injection reactions. 
In terms of serious adverse events, it was a little more common with ofatumumab, 10.3% versus 8.2%. In terms of serious infections, 12 versus 7 or 2.6% versus 1.5%. And two people did have a serious injection-related reaction on ofatumumab. In terms of neoplasms or cancers, there were three in people taking ofatumumab, but also three with abagio. And this is pretty similar to what you'd expect from the background rate, and no one died in this study. This is the Asclepios 2 trial, and the data are very similar. Again, the overall rate of infections is very similar, although for whatever reason in this study, definitely more people had injection-related reactions with opatumumab, 24.1% versus 13.5%, which makes a lot of sense because this drug is known to cause reactions. Although in serious infections, there was not a big difference, 12 versus 10 or 2.5% versus 2.1%. And in terms of cancers, two in the ofatumumab group versus one in the abagio group. There was one person who died, but they were actually not taking ofatumumab. They were taking abagio, and they died in, of an aortic dissection or a tear in the aorta, which is usually related to high blood pressure or other factors, probably not related to the drug. Now, if we look at the individual cancers of people taking ofatumumab, the reason this is a concern is because an increased risk of breast cancer was reported to be possible with Ocrevus. There was one case of breast cancer in someone taking ofatumumab, although this is similar to what you'd expect from the background rate. It's not that alarming for one person to get breast cancer out of this large trial. There was a case of melanoma, recurrent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and two people who had basal cell carcinoma of the skin, which is a common and easily curable cancer of the skin. In terms of serious infections, for some reason there were eight cases of appendicitis in ofatumumab versus only two in abagio, which is really weird. You wouldn't expect this drug to specifically cause appendicitis. Also, a lot of people in this trial were a little bit older, definitely older than the average age at which you'd be likely to get appendicitis, which usually occurs in teenagers and sometimes in people in their early 20s. But the average age in this trial was a little bit higher than that. There were three cases of gastroenteritis, uh, three UTI eyes, two cases of flu, one case of neutropenic sepsis, which is a serious infection associated with the weakened immune system, and neutropenia should not be caused by ofatumumab, so I'm not exactly sure what happened here. There was a case of osteomyelitis, or bone infection, and a pneumonia. This trial was completed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, so it's not really known how safe this drug is in terms of COVID-19. It is definitely thought that B-cell depleting agents could interfere with the immune response to SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19, but it's not really known. Some of the preliminary publications with rituximab and ocrelizumab, ocrevus, are actually pretty favorable. It doesn't seem like there's a dramatically higher rate of hospitalization or mortality in people taking these drugs who get COVID-19, but it's certainly something we're concerned about. Now, if we look at brain volume, there was not a statistically significant difference, but there is a trend suggesting that ofatumumab may be better. So we're looking at average annual change of brain volume loss. Now, it turns out that we're all losing brain. Our brains are shrinking, even with normal aging. But in MS, sometimes the brain is shrinking a little bit faster. So in Asclepios 1, the average rate of brain volume loss was 0.28% per year versus 0.35% with Abagio. So a little bit better, but not statistically significant. Similar results in Asclepios 2, 0.29% versus 0.35% average annual loss. But again, the p-value is 0.12. And you can see on the graph that there's a little bit of a trend towards ofatumumab being better, but the standard errors overlap. So it's unclear. Perhaps the effect is very marginal. So maybe if you have a very large sample size or a very large period of time, you would see some difference there. Now, if we look at serum neurofilament, we can see that ofatumumab is better. So serum neurofilament, it, neurofilament is a neuronal protein, and it's released into the blood with neuronal damage. It's normal to have some neurofilament in the blood at all times, but in MS, it is elevated. But you can see that the levels are somewhat lower in ofatumumab than in abagio. So 6.9 versus 9.0, and in Asclepios 2, 6.8 versus 9.0, and this is highly statistically significant. Significant P is less than 0 0.001. So that's all I have on this trial. If you have any questions or if you have suggestions for future videos, please post in the comments below.